Hello, Geography 231 students. Welcome to week 11. Uh, we are cruising through the semester. We are already uh, three quarters of the way through just about where we will be next week. Uh, so at this point in the semester, you should be working on projects. You should be hopefully making some progress with regards to collecting data, uh, hopefully narrowing down your geoprocessing tools that you'll be using. Um, and then also as you're working your way through your research, make sure you're taking notes. Uh, that way it's a fairly seamless process from taking down your, your research notes, uh, the tools you use, the data sources, eventually your um, results, and then kind of an analysis of your results. If you're taking notes, then you can basically just trans transition those information right into your final paper. So you have to remember, not only are you making a map and doing a presentation, you also have to write a, a three to five, four to five page paper. Uh, and so the easiest way to do that is just to make sure you're taking copious notes throughout the whole process so that uh, you don't have to try to recall things that you did, you know, three, four weeks prior. So um, it'll make the final paper a lot easier if you're literally just kind of writing as you're doing your work. And, um, and you might think, oh, how do I write five pages? Well, it'll actually fill up fairly quickly because you need to consider all the various uh, questions that I provide in the prompt and also uh, take a look at the rubric too. The rubric should be available on the assignment and that will show you what I'm looking for. Uh, and so, you, you know, you've got questions to consider, uh, previous research, what we call it sort of the literature uh, review, um, your, your findings, your analysis of your findings. So it, it, you'll fill up five pages real quickly. So just make sure that you're keeping tabs of all the information that you're acquiring over the next couple of weeks. Um, and you probably noticed last week, the week before, this week, they're all pretty short labs. All the labs that come out of uh, GIS tutorials too, pretty short. Um, and that's by design. Obviously, um, you're learning really important things right now. S uh, statistical analysis, hotspot analysis this week. Um, and so I'm not trying to go short on any of that, but I want you to um, you make sure that you have time uh, to actually make good progress on your, your final project. So uh, hopefully everybody is taking advantage of the time. And uh, let's see other announcements. Everybody's papers have been graded, obviously. Um, don't forget to vote. Hopefully you've already done it, voted early. If you haven't voted early, don't forget to vote on Tuesday. It's a pretty big one. Um, can't stress that one enough. It's a big election. Um, let's see here. No tutorial this week. It's the same the same tasks and uh, I guess the same approach as we've done the last couple of weeks. I provide the supplemental instructions. Refer to the supplemental instructions as you're going through the uh, tutorial. And this time it's tutorial 9.1, tutorial 9.2. Basically those are the lab assignments. Um, and we're going to be doing uh, clustering and outliers and then hotspot analysis for this week's lab. So um, again, download the PDF of the, uh, the scans from the textbook, and then also download the supplemental instructions, and then that will uh, that'll get you through it. All right, so without further ado, let us proceed. Okay, so this week's lecture, Hotspot Analysis, um, and it actually, it's, it's clustering more broadly. Hot, hotspot analysis is the main uh, geoprocessing tool I'm going to be discussing, but it's, it's hotspot analysis and clustering analysis. Uh, no tutorial, as I said, lab is going to be identifying clusters. That's tutorial 9.1 and tutorial 9.2 from the GIS tutorial textbook that I've scanned. You don't need to have that one. Uh, upon completion of this lecture and lab, you should understand what are the hot, uh, what are hotspots, uh, various hotspot analysis techniques, and how to evaluate z-scores. All right, so a quick recap before we jump back into uh, patterns. So identifying patterns recap. So thinking back to week nine, you were asked, why identify geographic patterns? Any distribution of features or attribute values within a defined area will create some sort of geographic pattern. That's just the nature of distribution. Um, naturally occurring features tend to cluster together. Uh, oftentimes, man-made features often are dispersed. It just depends. Uh, depends on the, the source and the orientation of the features. But there, there will be some sort of observable pattern um, in geographic space. So geographic patterns range from completely clustered to completely dispersed. A pattern that falls uh, at the point between the clustered and dispersed is often considered random. If you take the, uh, the middle point of these five little boxes, this would be random distribution. To the right, we have clustered. To the left, we have dispersed. A perfectly dispersed pattern would look something like there on the left. Examples of perfect dispersion might be 
orange trees in an orange grove. Every orange tree is a specific distance apart. They don't occur that way naturally though, right? Uh, if you're ever out in a, uh, we'll say a, a pine grove or a, a stand of trees, you'll see that some trees cluster together, some are farther apart. Um, broadly speaking, they might look like they're fairly dispersed, but it's really still a random distribution. To have a perfectly dispersed distribution, there's usually some sort of uh, involvement. It's not just natural, there's usually some sort of uh, human activity of some sort. Uh, clustering does tend to occur in the natural environment, as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago. Uh, even on the natural landscape, we see landscape features tend to cluster together. Deserts, mountains, bodies of water, and they cluster together for natural reasons, right? So dominant climate, tectonic activity, precipitation, things like that. So there are several methods for finding statistically significant clusters in data. I mentioned several of these over the last few weeks. Quadrants analysis, nearest neighbor index, which we've used, K functions, Gary C, Morin's I, and Geddes or General G. And those are all for showing whether or not a data set is clustered or dispersed, or if it's random, right? Uh, so these tools are useful for identifying patterns in the data, but they're not uh, able to visualize patterns. They're not able to actually create spatial data. So if you think back to last week and the week before, we were able to look at a bell curve and you were able to use that to basically determine based off of the z-score, is the data uh, statistically significantly clustered or dispersed uh, or is it random? But we weren't actually making any spatial data. We didn't actually make um, you know, a shape file or a feature class that was able to uh, visually illustrate clustering or dispersion. So we will be doing that this week. So the final point there was uh, those tools are not useful for cartography, only for spatial statistics. Each method answers the global, co global question of what's the probability the distribution of features is occurring by random chance? Uh, if the probability is high that it's occurring by, by random chance, then that means it's likely not the, uh, the cause uh, or the result of uh, dispersion or clustering. Each method has its benefits and its trade-offs. Some uh, identify spatial patterns only, like quadrants analysis, uh, nearest neighbor index, and k-functions. Right? So those are just about the distribution of features, not about the actual attributes themselves. Others identify patterns in location and in attributes, Gary C, Morin's I, and the Geddes or General G. But none of these identifies clusters of high and low values on the map. Uh, Morin's eye can uh, identify high clusters or low clusters with outliers, but it can't actually identify both high and low. To find hot spots and cold spots, which would be clusters of high and low values, we need a hot spot analysis tool. Before we get into that, let's answer the question, what are hot spots? So what are hotspots? Hotspots, hotspot analyses are spatial analysis and mapping techniques interested in the identification of clustering of spatial phenomenon. So just like the previous couple of weeks, we're still answering the question, are data clustered or are they dispersed? Uh, is the distribution of features or events random or is there some sort of um, occurring clustering or, or dispersion? These spatial phenomena are depicted uh, as points or polygons on a map and they, these points or polygons refer to either locations of events or objects. So if you look at the map here on the right, it's cardiovascular disease hotspots. So we could consider that uh, you know, uh, objects in the sense that they're people, but really these are specifically events. These are the occurrences or the prevalence of heart disease uh, among the general population, right? So people are distributed um, everywhere, basically corresponding with population density. So wherever there are people, there are going to be, uh, the, wherever there are settlements, rather, there will be people. And so if you look at this map, you don't even have to be a East Coast geography whiz to know that Boston is that large harbor there uh, to the east, uh, there's Cape Cod there to the southeast, and this is the Boston area. So you might think, okay, if this is just a population density map, then we would see most of the population right there on Boston. But that's not what this is. This is a, a statistically significant cluster map of cardiovascular disease. And so these clusters may be of high values, so high incidence of heart disease, which would be these large red clusters, or of uh, clusters of low incidence of of uh, heart disease. And so out here in western Massachusetts, uh, and sort of in central western Massachusetts, we see uh, areas where um, there are noticeably high clusters of low values, meaning that these communities tend to be healthier than uh, this area just south of Boston. All right, so 
Hotspot analyses use discrete features, points or polygons, not rasters, okay, to identify the locations of excuse me, statistical significance. So they could be high value clusters, like I said, the red spots, or low value clusters, the blue spots. So red, uh, generally speaking, we use the same symbology anytime you're doing hot spots and cold spots. Hot spots are red, cold spots are blue, and you know that's one of those uh, symbology things that we consider to be intuitive, right? Just like on a, a, a topographical map, uh, we'll say that higher elevations might be brown or white to represent uh, the mountains or snow, and lower elevations tend to be green. We associate that with plains like grass. Uh, so again, we use hot and cold because our minds see red, we think hot, cold, we think cold, uh, uh, blue, rather we think cold. So a hotspot is an area that has a higher uh, has a higher concentration of events compared to the expected number given a random distribution of events. So like nearest neighbor index, k functions, Gary C, and so on, hotspot analysis de uh, de depends on statistical significance testing. So just like the previous few uh, techniques we've learned over the last couple of weeks, statistical significance testing is still employed right but now it goes a step further and actually takes the results of those those statistical significance tests and puts them on the map the hot, hot spot detection evolved from the study of point distributions or spatial arrangements arrangements of points in space okay so things have evolved over time uh, uh, some of the old, older styles were quadrants analysis k functions those predate hot spot analysis because those were really just about the distribution of features they were not about the distribution of features and their attributes so hot spot analysis is a more recent uh, geo processing technique because it not only takes location into account it also takes values the density of points within a defined area is compared against a complete spatial randomness model, just like others, right? So if we were to expect spatially, spatial randomness, uh, we would be unlikely to find any uh, statistically significant clusters or uh, points of dispersion, okay? So beyond assessing the density of points in a given area, hotspot analysis techniques also measure the extent of point event interaction to, the, to understand spatial patterns. So it's not just about the density of points, it's also measuring the extent of the point event interaction. So how much do the points in one location, uh, 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 are they similar to those nearby them, right? So it's not just about like a clump of points, or in this case here, the cardiovascular map, it's not just about a clump of people together, because if that's all it was, then we would see a high density of people around Boston, but it's not about that. It's looking about high densities of values that are the same or similar, all right, so close to each other. So this allows for the spatial representation of high values and low values. All right, locating hotspots. Uh, just so you know, this map here I thought was interesting. It's actually prevalence of, of breast cancer across the United States. So again, it, uh, it might sort of look like a population density map, but it's actually not because there are areas like, we'll say, um, Arizona, Texas, where there are plenty of people still, but uh, we see clustering of low values. Uh, what is that? Arkansas actually has very low um, breast cancer rates across the state. So that's just found that, find that rather intriguing. It makes you wonder what are the... Uh, you know uh, factors involved with that i don't know all right so what are some tools for finding hot spots anselin local Morin's i that's what we're going to be using today in the lab uh, and that's also that's actually um, the technique the spatial and uh, the statistical analysis technique is known as anselin local Morin's i but the tool in arcgis pro is called clustering and outlier analysis tool uh get or gi star that's what you'll, I'll remind you in a moment, but it, that, that GI asterisk is called GI star, or not G asterisk. Um, and then finally, emerging hotspot analysis, which is um, a space mine, a space time pattern mining tool, which I will explain. It's a bit complicated. So first, Anselm Local Morin's I. Anselm Local Morin's I, also known as the clustering and outlier analysis tool. Uh, so given a set of input features and an analysis field, the cluster and outlier analysis tool identifies spatial clusters of features with high or low values. All right, so I put or in italics there to emphasize that it doesn't find both high and low, it finds high or low, okay? So if, we can, if it finds clusters of values, it's going to look at whether the values are high or low, and it will give you an output of one or the other, and it also identifies outliers. Okay, so if you're looking for high values, it will find clusters of high values and then outliers of high values in areas of low value, or vice versa with low values. It does so by using the Anselm Local Morin's I statistic. What is that statistic? Well, I'll point out uh, here the, these series of 
uh, formula that uh, are very complicated. And the good news is that you do not need to remember them or understand them. The GIS does all this for you. So thank goodness for modern computers, right? This is a GIS class, not a statistics class. So I'm not equipped to teach this, but I can just tell you that you don't need to know the math. You just need to know that um, these are the underlying formula whenever you run the Anselin Local Morin's I tool. So interpreting Anselin Local Morin's I, a positive value for the I indicates a feature has a neighboring has neighboring features with similarly high or low attribute values. Thus, this feature is part of a cluster. So if it's a positive value, that means that it is a, uh, a feature that has neighboring features with similarly high or low values, meaning it's part of a cluster. Okay, so a positive value means it's part of the cluster. A negative value for I indicates a feature has neighboring features with dissimilar values. Thus, it is an outlier. Okay, so that's all it comes down to. Positive values means it's part of a cluster. Negative values means it is an outlier. In either case, the p-value for the feature must be small enough for the cluster outlier to be considered statistically significant. So if that p-value is too high, then that means it's not statistically significant. So it's not a true cluster. It's not a true outlier. So we have to be aware both of the z-scores and p-values. Um, but actually, you don't really have to be aware of it because the GIS, again, takes this into account. And when it spits out the feature class, you can symbolize based off of either, score, uh, either field there. Uh, the Geddes or GI star tool. So the hotspot and it's, it's the Geddes or GI star is actually the statistic that the tool, which is called the hotspot analysis tool, relies upon. Okay, so the hotspot analysis tool calculates the Geddes or GI star statistic. Again, that's pronounced GI star for each feature in a data set. The GI star statistic uses both location and value in the pattern calculation. The result produces a map that shows clusters of high and low values. This is what differentiates the Geddes or GI star from the Anslin local Morin's I, in that Anslin local Morin's I can only uh, demonstrate or find high or low values, whereas Geddes or GI star can find low and high values. So if you want to show a map, like the cardiovascular map that shows the prevalence of uh, cardiovascular disease, you might want to show areas that have a, a higher need for medical uh, attention versus areas where maybe medical attention is already adequate, you don't need to focus more resources there, then you'd want to use Geddes or GI star. So really it shows you both uh, the highs and the lows. Uh, again, the Geddes or GI star uh, statistic is based off of very complicated mathematical formulae here for your uh, uh, pleasure or amusement, depending on your, your approach to math. Uh, the good news is, again, you don't need to remember or uh, or understand the math. The GIS does it for you. You just need to know what your inputs are. So interpreting the Geddes or GI star statistic. The GI star statistic looks at each feature within the context of neighboring features. Uh, a feature with a high value is interesting, but it may not be a statistically significant hotspot. Uh, so if we see a high value, that's it's worth looking into, but it may not be statistically significant, right? So to be statistically significant, a feature will have to have a high value and be surrounded by other features of high value as well. So it could be a high value, but it could be an outlier, right? So there might be a large city where, generally speaking, the uh, cardiovascular rates are healthy, but then to the north, you might find one neighborhood with very high rates of heart disease. And so that doesn't mean that that one area of heart, high heart disease is statistically significant if it's all by itself. So not only does the value have to be high, it also has to be surrounded by similarly high values. Or if it's low, then it has to be surrounded by similarly low values. Uh, so remember Tobler's first law of geography. Everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. Okay. So if there is an outlier, that means that it's not part of a statistically significant um, hotspot, right? So it might have a, the same value as the hotspot, but if it's too far from that hotspot, then it does not contribute to, um, the, it's not high quality information. It's information, it's a data point, but it's not statistically significant enough to constitute um, you know, a movement of resources from one area to the other, for example. So the GI star statistic uh, returned for each feature in the data set, and the data set is a Z score, right? So Z score basically indicates how significant 
uh, the, the data is. So for statistically significant positive z-scores, uh, the larger the z-score, the more intense the clustering of high values. So positive z-score equals clustering of high values. For statistically significant negative z-scores, the smaller the z-score, the more intense the clustering of the low values. All right, so negative z-scores, low values. Positive high values, negative low values. All right, so that's the Geddes Org GI star. Moving on to emerging hotspot analysis. So, emerging hotspot analysis is actually a relatively new tool that has only dated back to uh, more or less the the arrival of ArcGIS Pro uh, some six years ago or so. So, the emerging hotspot analysis tool identifies detailed clustering trends by analyzing temporal spatial data. It's a key word there. Temporal refers to time. Okay. So not only does it look at, look at clusters, it doesn't just look at the location, it doesn't just look at the value, it also looks at when these data points occur in time. So essentially you have three values, or three data points, location, value, and period of time. Okay, so you can imagine clusters obviously occur in space, right? Imagine the distribution of, we'll say houses, um, uh, we'll say uh, houses with a, a, pop, a household size of five or more, all right? So high population households tend to cluster together, usually in areas of apartments and townhomes, whereas lower population density tends to happen in uh, single family homes, right? So those are clustering in space, but then there's also time involved as well. So with time, we see that um, we'll say household sizes have have actually gotten smaller, right? Over time, the average um, you know woman has fewer children now than she did 50 years ago, for example. So you've got essentially three different factors to look at: location, value, and time. Okay. So the data set, the data sets that include timestamps like date or year are aggregated spatially and temporally into what's called a space-time cube, which is a great name. It's a it's a very interesting name, which certainly piques the interest of the the initiated, right? So you, to create a space-time cube, there are actually a couple of different ways in ArcGIS Pro. In order to to run the emerging hotspot analysis, it's actually a two-step process. You first have to create your space-time cube from your input data, then you take that space-time cube and you plug it into the emerges emerging hotspot analysis tool. So the GIS, uh, so you begin by aggregating data that is time enabled with either a, a date or a year, aggregates it spatially and temporally into the time, time, uh, space time cube, which is illustrated here. So um, across the vertical axis, we have time. Across the horizontal, we have location. Okay. Uh, and then the GIS calculates the Geddes or GI star statistic for each bin of data. And each bin represents both period of time and location. Okay. And so if you look at these examples here, they represent location distributed over, over space uh, on the X axis and over time on the Y axis. And there's actually a lot of really cool things you can do with this data. Uh, we're not going to get into it, I don't believe, um, but in 231, I think we'll, or 232 rather, we might get into it in the, in the uh, spring. Uh, so bins are time enabled spatial data. They are spatial data that represent what uh, existed on the landscape at a given point in history. Once the space-time hotspot analysis completes, each bin in the space-time cube has an associated z-score, p-value, and hotspot classification. So this is really another major difference between the GI star statistic and the hotspot tool, uh, hotspot analysis tool versus the emerging hotspot analysis tool. All of these bins is given uh, this classification. Classifications range from a new hotspot or cold spot, consecutive, meaning they occur over multiple years, intensifying, so going from a low to a high value, uh, persistent, well, I'm not sure what persistent and cons consecutive are, uh, maybe persistent means the entire time, consecutive means multiple years together, uh, diminishing would start from a high to a low value, sporadic means that these values come and go. Oscillating goes from low to high, low to high, and then historical would be was at one point a high value and has become a low value. So uh, this works both for cold and for hot spots. So high density or high values and low, low values. Uh, and so ultimately you end up with um, a very unique looking output and um, you're obviously encouraged to explore the tool on your own if you want to. If you happen to be doing a uh, project that involves uh, time-enabled data, I encourage you to explore the hotspot analysis. I know at least a couple of you are looking at like terrorism historically, and so this might be a useful uh, tool for you if you want to um, look at the prevalence of terrorism over time in, in a given location.
So got each uh, of the tools I've discussed here in their table, Anselin, Local, Moran's Eye, Geddes, or GI Star, and the space-time um, pattern mining, uh, which is known as the Emerging Hotspot tool. Uh, I won't go over these because this is just everything I just said, but this data, or this table may be useful for you if you need to refer back to uh, the tools that were discussed. All right, so thus concludes uh, the week 11 lecture. Uh, when you are finished with this, obviously, go ahead and jump into this week's lab. As I said before, it's not going to be a tutorial, uh, but the techniques are the same as they've been. Um, relative, this is probably the shortest one we've actually had in the last three weeks. Uh, it's very short, but I am looking for two maps. So you're going to create a, two different map layouts that are already basically there. You're just going to plug data into the legends for each one. Uh, so um, yeah, if you have any questions, as usual, feel free to email or post on the discussion board. Uh, keep working on projects. Let me know if you have any questions. Happy to uh, take any Zoom uh, meetings that are needed. And uh, yeah, so have a great day and don't forget to vote.